first monthly, our first monthly CHIPS Accelerator event. We are absolutely thrilled that Morrison Foster is kicking off this series with a discussion today about hot button issues currently facing the Supreme Court. I'm Bridget Johnson. I'm the Director of Partner and Business Development for CHIPS, and I'm joined today by Jen Hagen, who is our Director of Community, as well as Joan Toth, who is our Executive Director. Joan, would you like to say a few words of welcome? Absolutely. Thank you, Bridget. And welcome everyone. Uh, we have been really anticipating this great session. It's a, a hot topic and we're looking so forward to hearing what Deanne and Lena have to say. Uh, but first of all, um, thank you for being here this morning. You know, everyone gets so much great knowledge from CHIPS, especially from our global summit but we wanna bring chips to you 24 seven, 365. And what that means is the opportunities for all of the great thought leadership in the firms uh, and the companies that are chips members uh, and supporters to, to share with you. And so uh, welcome, this is the first of the Accelerator series and we're delighted uh, to welcome Morris and Forrester. And now I'll turn it back to Bridget. Bridget. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joan. Our presenters today include Deanne Maynard, who is the co-chair of Morrison Foster's Appellate and Supreme Court Practice, and her colleague, Lena Hughes. And so I'm going to turn it over to them and have them introduce themselves to you. Thanks so much, uh, Bridget, Joan, and Jen. We're so excited to be here. My name is Deanne Maynard. Uh, as Bridget said, I'm the co-chair of the Appellate and Supreme Court Practice at Morrison and Forster. I have 14 arguments in the US Supreme Court. I also have 40 patent appeal arguments in the federal circuit. We team a lot, our appellate group does with our fabulous uh, intellectual property group here at Morrison and Forrester. And I'm so pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Lena Hughes, who's of counsel in the appellate group. And Lena herself, she clerked for Justice Kagan and she has multiple arguments uh, in courts of appeals. So we, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try to keep, a, keep we have a timer, we have a buzzer and we are going to keep moving through the topics. Uh, so if you don't like what we're talking about or you're bored, don't worry, we're about to be done and we're going to move on when the buzzer goes off, uh, even if we're in mid thought. So back one slide, I think, Ani, to the just some important reminders, because I know that as excited as you already hear from us, you're also hoping to get some CLE. So you will receive a CLE link from the CEU Institute by email following this program. And we ask that you complete it within three business days. And at some point near the end, we're gonna read the CLE code, which you will want to write down. And uh, you, I assume, can um, follow the instructions on the stuff that you receive. So without further ado, um, Lena is gonna kick us off, go. So we're gonna talk about uh, some big cases from the term, but before we dive into those, we wanna talk numbers because there are some interesting stats coming out of the Supreme Court. And our source for these statistics comes from what's known as the SCOTUS blog stat pack. They've been collecting data on the Supreme Court for over a decade now. So they're able to identify trends that we see at the Supreme Court. And one of the biggest trends that we're seeing with this last term is a dramatic decline in unanimity at the Supreme Court. Now, I know maybe that doesn't surprise you, but what might surprise you is that there actually used to be quite a lot of unanimity. On average, over the last decade, I would say 43% of the Supreme Court's decisions were decided 9-0. So that, that figure tends to surprise people that it was that high. But this last term was more in line with people's expectations. Last term, only 29% of decisions were decided 9-0 by the Supreme Court. So that's a pretty dramatic drop from 43% down to 29%. And while we're seeing this dramatic drop in 9-0 decisions, we're seeing a great rise in the number of six to three decisions. And in particular, most of those decisions that we're seeing are ideological six threes. In other words, we're seeing the six conservatives on one side and the three conservatives on the other side. And some of the biggest- Three liberals, you mean. <laughs> yeah, three liberals on the <laughs> other side. And, and some of the biggest cases 
from last term were de decided in these ideological 6-3 breakdowns. So, for example, the Second Amendment case last term that was decided coming out of New York was an ideological 6-3 uh, the decision about EPA's ability to regulate carbon emissions was decided 6-3. And there were a pair of religion cases that also divided that way. We're also seeing that the median justice has changed. Now with this new court composition, the chief justice and Justice Kavanaugh tend to be the median justice. Each of them was in the majority a remarkable 95% of the time last term. They dissented each only three times all terms. That's a great track record for them. And their dissents came in the same cases. So we're seeing that they're really, the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh are quite aligned uh, in terms of case outcomes. And who's most often in the minority then? Well, this probably won't surprise you that it is among the liberal justices. Justice Sotomayor was least frequently in the majority. She was in the majority only 58% of the time last term. And of course, these stats are from last term when Justice Breyer was still on the court and he did not fare that much better. He was in the majority only 68% of the time and Justice Kagan only 69% of the time. Who's, who would you say is the most unpredictable conservative? Well, it's interesting you should ask that because the, the conservative bloc is, is not really completely aligned with each other. And what's most notable is that Justice Gorsuch is the least likely conservative to be in the majority. He was in the majority only 75% of the time. Compare that with Justice Kavanaugh and the Chief Justice being in the majority 95% of the time. You can see that the conservative majority is not always voting as a block. And I mean, that's not surprising. A lot of people have talked about Justice Gorsuch's sort of unique ideologies. Uh, in particular, he is more of an originalist like Justice Thomas is. Uh, whereas Justice Kavanaugh and the Chief Justice tend to be more uh, moderate conservatives, precedent-focused conservatives. Um, but even between Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch, we see uh, originalism disputes about what does the history really tell us. Um, so I think with an increased emphasis and focus on the conservative block of this court, we're seeing that there are differences among them. Being One of the other new things about uh, the, the court in the last term and a half has been the style of the oral arguments, which had, do you want to talk a bit about that? Because I think that's an interesting. Yeah, this has been a pretty dramatic change at the Supreme Court, too. So in the past, uh, arguments went for about an hour. In fact, they were pretty strictly limited to an hour. You could be cut off mid-sentence if you went past your allotted time. The old and chief, you would cut people off mid-phrase. Chief Justice Rehnquist, if the red light came on, you were stopping. And if you right. didn't ask permission to stop, he would definitely cut you off. <laughs> if you didn't and and meanwhile, the, the justices uh, during that time period were engaging in a sort of free-for-all questioning. They would cut each other off. They would ask questions at any point in time, and the advocate would need to respond. But now we're seeing sort of post-pandemic a, a dramatic shift in multiple respects. One is that we have a hybrid oral argument style where the first half of oral argument is this free for all freestyle uh, questioning by the justices, followed then by seriatim questioning by the justices in order of seniority. That was something that was adopted during the pandemic when they were having telephonic oral arguments, but they've now retained it now that they're back in person. And this combination has led to much longer arguments, really dramatically longer. A number of arguments this term have gone for three hours or even more um, in a single case. Again, that's up from a, a one hour time limit in the past. Um, so one of the, the other justices are making oh. jokes about this. Like, yeah. Are we at lunch already? yet? Is it afternoon yet? So and one of the other interesting developments post pandemic is that uh, Justice Thomas now regularly asks questions. So I mean, he went a decade at one point in the old free freestyle uh, mode without asking uh, 
I think a single question over a decade. Maybe he asked one. I had an argument where I thought he was going to ask a question. He leaned forward and then he ended up, somebody jumped in and he didn't ask anything. Um, but the, um, you know, now the justices seem to be deferring to him to ask the first question. And, and Kagan or Justice Kagan or Justice Sotomayor publicly commented that that was kind of like a tacit agreement that they would let Justice Thomas ask the first question or so. And, and he's regularly doing that. And I think that's a definite add to the oral arguments to have Justice Thomas's voice. Yeah, it has been a change. He previously said the reason he didn't do it was to give advocates time to argue. He feels they, it seems he feels they now have that time with this hybrid oral argument style. So now we're on to our next topic. One thing that I think all the litigators and, and people who are in-house in particular should pay attention to is this case, uh, Mallory versus Norfolk Southern Railway Company, which addresses where companies can be sued. So the Supreme Court heard oral argument in this case, and it has the potential to subject, you know, to make, um, to expand quite a bit where companies can be sued. This suit involves a Pennsylvania statute. And in Pennsylvania, they require companies to submit to general personal jurisdiction as a condition of registering to do business with the state. So when you fill out the form saying you're going to be a business in Pennsylvania, you have to consent to, to general jurisdiction. Robert Mallory is the plaintiff. He's a Virginia resident who worked for Northern Southern Railway, which is a Virginia-based railway, and he worked in Virginia and Ohio, not in Pennsylvania. Nevertheless, he sued his former employer in Pennsylvania State Court for allegedly exposing him to cancer-causing chemicals. So, so we, what, just to put you know, what we have is a suit by someone who doesn't live in Pennsylvania uh, against a company that isn't in, in a, you know, that is not in Pennsylvania about something that happened not in Pennsylvania. So the Pennsylvania uh, Supreme Court, despite the Pennsylvania statute, held that he couldn't bring that suit in the Pennsylvania courts, that compelling submission to general jurisdiction would violate the Fourth Amendment's due process clause. So, and for those of you for whom Fed courts is a distant memory, uh, just a little refresher on the due process clause and how it's been applied to personal jurisdiction against defendants. So it comes in two varieties, as you'll recall, specific and general, and a court with specific jurisdiction over an out-of-state defendant can only hear claims that specifically arise from the defendant's contacts with that particular state. But a court with general jurisdiction can hear any and all claims against the defendant. But traditionally, the Supreme Court has said that general jurisdiction requires that the defendant's affiliations with the forum state uh, are so constant and pervasive that the company's essentially at home in that state. So, but, but here, the sole basis for jurisdiction is the Pennsylvania statute. So this, the Supreme Court's taken it up. You know, the, the plaintiff has got taken the case to the Supreme Court. And according to the plaintiff, um, before the 14th Amendment, uh, there were these consent by registration statutes and Congress himself enacted one in the District of Columbia. Yeah, that was something interesting to me about this case was the very heavy focus the plaintiff is taking on history here. You know, really delving into the historical record to trace any sort of analogous statute that might have existed at the time the 14th Amendment was enacted or even before then. And I think that that's a symptom of something bigger that we're seeing at the Supreme Court, which is a renewed focus on historical analysis as a mode of legal interpretation, particularly of the Constitution. Right. And I mean, I know we saw that last term in the Second Amendment case where they were looking at how many cases, how many statutes existed at the time the Second Amendment was enacted that resembled the New York statute at issue there. And a lot of people predicted litigants are going to be relying a lot more heavily on history now that they know that the Supreme Court is more interested in it. And, and we saw that, I mean, completely in the plaintiff's brief here. Yeah. And that oral argument, Justice Thomas asked, um, well, how many states is enough? So like at the founding, how many states have to have adopted it before we think that it's something that the founders would have assumed was you know, built into the Constitution? Um, and Justice Spirit pushed the plaintiffs on whether or not they're, you know, how, how analogous were the, the, the historical service of process statutes, which is what they were relying on, how comparable were they to this Pennsylvania consent scheme? 
Um, another another question that the justices were kicking around the oral argument, and it seems um, is is what exactly is the precise nature of the constitutional right that the railroad is asserting? Is it that an out of state corporation has a due process clause right not to be hailed into court and in, in, into a state that's not its principal place of business? Or is it something, um, a right more based in the, what we call the dormant commerce clause, which Lena is gonna talk about later at more late, you know, do they have some sort of right of unfettered access to Pennsylvania's market? Or is it some combination of those two things? Right. And on the other side of all of the arguments here is, is a pretty heavy argument in favor of precedent. You know, the railroad, while the plaintiff is looking to history, the railroad here is pointing to quite a large body of Supreme Court precedent, uh, international shoe and all of its progeny that would suggest that you cannot hail uh, a defendant into a state court in which the claim doesn't arise out of their contacts with the state. Um, so we noticed, I think, during oral arguments, certain justices be more attached to the precedent arguments like the Chief Justice and Justice Kagan, and then other justices like the originalists that we talked about being more interested in the historical record. And that included Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch and Justice Barrett, I would say. That's true. And another complicating issue here was is the question of consent, like what kind of consent is needed. Justice Jackson, who is a formal cr criminal defense lawyer and a former district court judge, she wanted to know why the railroad couldn't waive its constitutional rights by registering to do business, just like a criminal defendant can waive their constitutional rights in court. So she was kind of pressing on the disparity. Yeah, and this is just one of the cases the Supreme Court's taking up that have potentially dramatic impacts on civil litigation. In fact, I think the Supreme Court just recently has another grant that litigators are gonna really want to pay attention to. That's true. So for all of you trial lawyers out there and pellet lawyers or people who do both, um, the court has taken up a question um, it, that's just recently been granted about whether or not if you make a, a summary judgment motion early in a case and you lose on a legal question, say you argue the statute doesn't cover uh, the defendant's conduct, the, the district court rejects that as a matter of law, and you, and you proceed to trial. Do you need to reassert that argument, that that argument at the J-Mall phase in order to preserve it for appeal? The majority of the court's appeals say no, but some say yes, and the Supreme Court has taken that question to decide it, so you should definitely keep your eye on that case. So our next case here is about the Dormant Commerce Clause, um, and people often say that you do not want to know how the sausage gets made. And I think after learning about this case, uh, you might be able to see why. The case that we're talking about here is National Pork Producers versus Ross. And it's a case about industry practices for raising pork in this country. Uh, according to the state of California and an animal rights group, a common practice in raising pork is to keep the mother pigs in something that's called a gestational crate for their entire lives where they are unable to turn around or sit down. And it was this particular crating practice that prompted some California interest groups to propose a ballot initiative known as Proposition 12, which was then adopted by California voters. Proposition 12 prohibits the sale of pork into California that was raised in what the proposition terms a cruel manner. So specifically, it prohibits the sale of pork in California that comes from a mother pig that was housed in a space that prevented her from turning around or gave her anything less than 24 square feet. Now, Proposition 12 caused quite a stir in the pork industry. And that's because California is a big market for pork. It consumes about 13% of the nation's pork, but it produces almost none of it. In fact, over 99% of the pork that's sold in California is produced outside of the state. So the pork producers complained that this proposition's costs are going to be borne almost entirely by out-of-state pork producers and that this creates a burden on interstate commerce. Now, the legal hook that the pork producers had for their claim is the dormant commerce clause. 
Now, as many of you know, of course, the Constitution's Commerce Clause grants Congress the authority to regulate interstate commerce. But that grant of authority is not at issue in this case because no one disputes Congress has not acted to regulate pork housing standards in the country. But the Supreme Court has long recognized that there is a so-called dormant commerce clause under which even when Congress has not legislated and has not exercised its commerce clause authority, state legislation can still be invalid if it interferes in particular ways with interstate commerce. And so that's basically what the pork producers are arguing here, right? That California is such a big market and the what the requirements of the California statute is it's going to what the pork producers say is it's going to change the way pork has to be raised everywhere in the country. Right. And the way that California comes back to that argument is to say we're only regulating what is sold into our state's market. And if you don't want to raise your pork in the manners that we're requiring, you just don't have to sell into our market. Um, there is a factual dispute, of course, about how easy it is to distinguish uh, at the outset which pork is destined for which market. And the pork producers claim that they will effectively need to raise all of their pork in the manner that California requires if even a small portion of it is destined for the California market. I think what's what was most interesting about oral argument in this case is how focused the justices are on the slippery slope arguments in both directions. Yeah, I mean, this isn't really about pork, just that or just about pork, right? Right. It is coming to the court under the heading of a pork case, but it's about so much more because it's really about the limits of state's authority to pass legislation that has effects outside of its borders. And as you can imagine in today's day and age, commerce being what it is, a lot of state legislation is going to directly or indirectly impose costs on producers who are outside of the state. Um, and we saw at oral argument that some justices, Justice Barrett and Justice Kagan in particular, were really concerned about just how many states' laws are going to be uh, in danger if we were to say that this law is invalid or that this state's a valid dormant commerce clause claim. Sort of um, giving hypotheticals from both sides of the ideological spectrum, right? Depending on. Right, exactly. I mean, you can you can see this being a problem in either direction. And so another concern from the justices was what happens if we uphold this law? What sort of laws are states going to be encouraged to pass? Because as Justice Kagan said, uh, if we uphold this law, states could start building in their policy disputes into their laws. So for example, they could pass laws prohibiting the sale of products in their states that were made by companies that used the labor of undocumented immigrants or by companies that uh, prohibited uh, unionization of workers or even by companies that uh, refused to fund certain types of health care. And as Justice Kagan said, because we are a divided nation, the sustaining of this law could beget a sort of tit for tat, a balkanization among the states, which um, people have pointed out was in fact what the framers had in mind when they enacted the Commerce Clause and what they were trying to prevent. It is one of the interesting things, like she starkly just sort of says, we are a divided nation and we are, and, and she said, that's, this is not the only argument in which she's made that point. Um, one of the other things too, is that at least a couple of the justices don't even think there is a dormant commerce clause, right? Right. And this goes, this is in line with um, originalist thought and uh, those who are focused on the text. You know, as I've suggested from the outset, the dormant commerce clause isn't in the Constitution. There is a Commerce Clause granting authority to Congress, but there isn't anything saying that when Congress hasn't acted, the states cannot act themselves. And that view seems to be shared uh, pretty strongly by Justice Gorsuch and by Justice Thomas. There were questions by them at oral argument uh, suggesting how can this violate the Commerce Clause or uh, interfere with interstate commerce. Uh, when it's only regulating California's market and the sale of pork there. 
Okay, our next uh, case is about elections. So uh, this is another hot button issue where the country may be divided. Um, and, and this is case uh, about the independent state legislature theory. It's an argument that's arisen in, in recent contentious elections dating back to Bush v. Gore, also the Pennsylvania election in 2020. The case this term is Moore v. Harper. It arises from North Carolina and North Carolina's map for its congressional districts. So Republican controlled North Carolina legislature adopted a new congressional map and it giving uh, as many as 10 of the state's 14 seats to Republicans, even though the state is pretty evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. A group of Democratic voters and nonprofits went to state court to challenge the map as a partisan gerrymander that violated the state's constitution. The North Carolina Supreme Court agreed and based on language in its constitution, blocked the state from using that map in the 2022 elections. The, after the legislature proposed a revised map in the further litigation, the trial court rejected it and instead adopted a new map with the help of three experts appointed by the court. The, um, the legislature for North Carolina then sought an immediate stay from the Supreme Court and that stay was denied, but three justices, Justice Alito, Thomas and Gorsuch dissented, basically saying the North Carolina Supreme Court was clearly wrong. Justice Kavanaugh, who didn't join that part, did say, let's grant cert. And they have, and they've, ha and they've had argument. And the petitioners are essentially swinging for the fences. And they basically say that whatever state legislatures say about redistricting goes. And their theory relies heavily on the elections clause, the text of the elections clause in the constitution. And so just to remind everybody that the key part of that is the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. So it doesn't say by the states, it says by the legislature. And so the argument is legislature means legislature and therefore no other component of the state, including judicial review in the courts, can override the state's legislature's determination for how a federal election can be conducted. You know, I can see that argument as, as a sort of simple reading of the text, but it's, isn't it kind of hard to square the argument that legislature only meets legislature with Supreme Court precedent? So they have a hard, they have a hard, the challengers have a hard, the legislature has a harder time with precedent. So uh, North Carolina has a divided government. So the legislature is representing itself. The governor of North Carolina is a Democrat. And so the, 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 the North Carolina governor is representing the Supreme Court and is defending um, the North Carolina Supreme Court along with others. Um, and they point to, in particular, a case uh, called Smiley, where the court upheld a governor's power to veto a state legislative map. And so what they say is, and their argument is, Yes, the federal constitution says the legislature must draw it, but when the framers use the word legislature, they took with it all the checks and balances that come in each state uh, govern, government with their legislative process. So that means if the state allows for governor veto, if the state has judicial review, uh, the state constitution limits uh, places limits on the legislative power, then that governs here. Um, the comeback to that by the, by the, the North Carolina legislature is, no, it says legislature, and they're essentially, in essence, being delegated this power by the federal government, and so no state checks can apply to it. Um, and there are different varieties of this so-called independent state legislature theory. There's sort of a strong version, a, a medium strong version, a weak version, and one of the questions here is which, if any of these variations of the independent state legislature doctrine will the Supreme Court adopt here? I mean, the strongest, as Deanne said, would be to say what the legislature says goes and uh, we're gonna overrule Smiley and say, you know, the governor cannot have a role in vetoing state laws about elections because the elections clause says so. Um, so they and and but but they don't really ask for overruling a smiley. So they say you can adopt our strong version of legislature without overruling the governor because the governor the the court what their argument is the governor 
in that case was part of the legislative process, that that was part of the legislative, the, the law didn't become a law until the governor vetoed it or not. Whereas they say state judicial review is the state, the state courts are not acting as part of the legislative process. They're, 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 they're distinctly not, you know, they're being courts and they're reviewing the legislation for compliance with the state constitution. So that's how they would draw the line there. I mean, the, the, the North Carolina government and the voters who are challenged, who are trying to support what the North Carolina Supreme Court did, um, they, they would allow that there's some extreme things that state courts could do where they essentially, it was so out of bounds from, uh, from interpreting the state constitution that you know, there would be a federal question there for the U.S. Supreme Court to decide that they'd gone too far. But they say the, the legislature here has taken state law as interpreted by the state Supreme Court, isn't challenging that. So they say there's no need to decide that question here because it isn't presented. Um, I mean, um, the, well, and one yeah. other option for uh, a sort of middle ground would be to say that the the state courts do have authority to um, determine that a, a legislation about elections is invalid under the state constitution, but they don't have authority to propose a remedy like they did here. Because, you know, backing up, what happened here was that the state Supreme Court found the map to be gerrymandered and invalid under the state constitution, but then ultimately had uh, state court appointed experts redraw another map to impose on the state. And right. arguably that could go too far uh, in effectively having the state courts instead of the legislature enact the elections legislation. Right, and here North Carolina would say, well, here the legislature uh, passed, has passed a statute allowing the trial court to do that in certain circumstances. So anyway, stay tuned. This is a this will be a really important decision when it comes out. So our next case uh, on the docket here is really part of a series of cases that the Supreme Court has seen in recent years that involve a clash between generally applicable public accommodations or anti-discrimination laws on the one hand and the religious objections of service providers on the other hand. So several years ago, the Supreme Court granted cert in a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop, where a conservative Christian baker uh, had religious objections to making wedding cakes for same-sex weddings. And then a few terms later, the Supreme Court granted cert in a case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, where the City of Philadelphia was attempting to apply its anti-discrimination rules to Catholic organizations that had religious objections to certifying same-sex couples as foster parents. Now, in both of those cases, the Supreme Court ultimately ruled for the religious objectors, but did so on narrow grounds that didn't address the bigger legal question, uh, which was, is there a free exercise or a free speech right for individuals to be exempt from generally applicable anti-discrimination laws. And in this next case that we're going to talk about, 303 Creative versus Elenis, the Supreme Court is getting its third chance to address that bigger legal question. Now, the background here is about a woman, Lori Smith, who is a graphic artist and website designer. And she wants to design wedding websites, but she has religious objections to designing them for same-sex weddings. For her, the impediment is Colorado's anti-discrimination or public accommodations law, which makes it unlawful for a business to deny services based on certain protected characteristics. That would include race, religion, gender, and significantly to this case, sexual orientation. That law also prohibits businesses from communicating to the public that they will withhold or deny services based on those protected characteristics. So Ms. Smith sued the state of Colorado, saying that this violates her rights under the free speech clause of the Constitution. She also raised a free exercise clause claim, but the Supreme Court did not grant cert on that issue. So it's only addressing the free speech issue.
It seems like a lot of the fight here between the parties is between Colorado and Ms. Smith is what exactly is being regulated. Right, because according to Smith, it, this law, this Colorado public accommodations law directly regulates her speech. As she puts it, her wedding websites are speech. And the law in question is compelling her to speak a message that she doesn't agree with, which is that a wedding between same-sex couples is occurring and being celebrated. But Colorado has a different view of what's being regulated. They say we're only regulating a sales transaction or a, a services transaction. If a service provider wants to offer a service or a good into the public market, it has to do so on an equal basis. So if there is a wedding website that Ms. Smith would sell to an opposite sex couple, she has to be willing to sell that same wedding website to a same sex couple. A lot of the discussion or arguments seem to be exactly how bespoke is this website that she wants to make versus how can does it, does that matter? What are the right. facts here? Yeah, we, we heard questions from Justice Kagan asking about what the wedding website. We learned two like. of her clerks are getting married this year. I, it sounded like not to each other. It sounded like there were two separate wedding websites that Justice Kagan had checked out. That's right. She said she, it was not a hypothetical. She seems to have viewed their wedding websites and she asked questions geared to whether the type of service Ms. Smith is providing is really a standard plug and play service or is it a more bespoke service? Because I think as Justice Kagan pointed out, some wedding websites uh, will just say things like the date and time of the wedding, uh, the, the venue, um, accommodations in the area, other, you know, entertaining things to do in the city. And if that is what the website is providing, she suggested, is there really expressive content to that? Um, part but the, part of the challenge here seems to be like, this is a pre-enforcement challenge, right? So there's stipulated facts, not exactly actual facts. That's right. I mean, she's bringing this because she wants to offer wedding websites as opposed to having already done so. So the record in play is a little stunted, uh, or at least the justices had questions about it that couldn't be answered because those facts haven't been developed yet. And then the another big focus that oral ahead. argument was sort of the, the slippery slope arguments um, that both sides were making here. I mean, Colorado is warning that Ms. Smith's theory is unbounded and that there's really no limit to the objections uh, that people could have that could get them a pass out of complying with discrimination laws. And there was a pretty dramatic uh, hypothetical that was offered by Justice Jackson during this. She asked, for instance, whether a, a store that was offering uh, It's a Wonderful Life photos with Santa that were meant to invoke the 1940s and 50s could refuse to photograph black children. Um, and the issue is that uh, what, apply, what arises here in the context of LGBTQ rights is also potentially applicable to the other protected characteristics under Colorado's public accommodations law. I think that's one of the questions that the justices seem to be grappling with and their back and forth questioning of the advocates and is there a line that can be drawn as you all may remember in Justice Kennedy's um, same-sex marriage opinion, he said, he, he, no he noted that people have, um, you know, sincerely held beliefs on both sides of that issue. And what do we make of that? Is that a distinction to, that can be used to make a difference between that and maybe uh, race? Um, so speaking of race, we're going to talk about the affirmative action cases. The courts got two cases pending this term, challenging the consideration of race admissions, one involving Harvard's admission uh, process, so a private university, and one involving a public university uh, from my home state, the University of North Carolina. So the background here, as you may remember, in Grutter v. Bollinger, the court upheld consideration of race in higher education admissions uh, involving the University of Michigan. and held that they, that race can be taken into account as one of many factors in a holistic determination 
if necessary, to achieve a diverse class. But universities under that decision are only permitted to go so far. They can't have racial quotas. Um, they can't give some sort of uniform statistical advantage to underrepresented minorities. So the plaintiffs in both the Harvard and the UNC cases argue that Grutter should be overruled. And that's ultimately what's at issue. They say the court should hold that both the federal civil rights statutes and the federal constitution require that college admissions be 100% race blind. The challengers argue that the, pol the policies in place at Harvard and UNC um, giving advantage to underrepresented minorities has resulted in discrimination against Asian American applicants. And they argue that race alternatives, race neutral, excuse me, alternatives can be used to uh, maintain diversity such as a proposal that they put forth under which Harvard would eliminate things like um, legacy advantages for children of alumni and, and not give increase uh, and, and start increasing the admissions, you know, thumb on the scale for socioeconomic status. So Harvard and UNC both dispute all of those things as a matter of fact. And in fact, this case is different than some of the previous ones the court has considered because it actually had a full trial that went into great depth about the different uh, admissions policies. And there's lots of findings of fact, and, and the, the universities in both cases won the trial. So uh, they are relying heavily on the factual findings that were affirmed in the courts of appeals. So well, I guess even see the case skip the court of appeals, but that the um, the and 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 the and the universities, so so they, they really like they strongly reject um, the arguments made by the challengers, and they they make originalist arguments on their behalf, saying they're looking at race conscious based legislation passed around the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment, like the Freedmen's Bureau. Yeah, this is another example of um, we're seeing litigants more and more taking the originalist approach. And although um, originalism is often associated with uh, the more conservative justices, we're seeing that it can work in both directions. Uh, for instance, here to potentially support what is traditionally viewed as a liberal favored policy affirmative action by pointing to similar laws that existed at the time the 14th Amendment was enacted. So, and, and one of the fights here, it's, it's interesting, is like who owns, um, who owns Brown v. Board of Education and its legacy. So, is is the is the principle coming out of that that you know uh, it's okay to to consider race for certain purposes but not others or is it that it's never okay to consider race for any reason at all? Right, and we know that some of the justices have have taken clear positions on that in the past. Uh, the chief justice has famously said that the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, by which he has meant to stop considering race as a factor. Um, so one question in this case is, is what role the chief justice is going to have on this decision? Because we talked about him being the median justice. Right. And the chief is also, as people are probably aware, also more of an institutionalist, as is, I think, Justice Kavanaugh, who's also one of the median justices. Um, and the chief has in cases where, like abortion case a couple of terms ago, you know, a, you know, a, you know, put a, th you know, felt strongly about holding to precedent. And so here, the the petitioners are asking for Grutter to be overruled. And you know, one issue is kind of like, where will the chief come out on that between precedent and his views about uh, that he's expressed about, you know, being race blind. Mm -hmm. Um, Go Justice Jackson also has a pretty interesting role in these two cases um, because she is recused from the Harvard case. Right. So she she was on the board of overseers of Harvard, which from where, which she graduated. And so in her confirmation hearing, she was asked, would she participate in the Harvard case if she were confirmed? And she said she would not. So then once she was confirmed, when these cases were granted, they were originally consolidated and were going to be heard together, meaning having an oral argument together. But um, once she was confirmed, given her recusal from the Harvard case, they deconsolidated the cases, had separate arguments, and she participated only in the US, the UNC case. Um, 
Right. But, and this sort of eliminates any risk of a four to four deadlock. That's usually why they'll split cases like that, where a justice is recused in one, but not recused in another that presents the same sort of issues. Um, right. I mean, they could even like, I mean, they, what they do is like rule, rule in the UNC case and then potentially it would govern, you know, to the extent it's 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 precedent for the Harvard case, it would just govern. Um, even without her vote. So the United that, States yeah. also has a sort of unique role in this case. Um, usually the United States view is, is given pretty hefty weight in the Supreme Court because they too are an institutional figure and a repeat player in the Supreme Court. Uh, but this is one of the cases where the United States position shifts from administration to administration. So we saw we, we saw that throughout the life of these cases, in fact. Right. Uh, because though I was yeah. going to say the Trump administration uh, had actually uh, taken the contrary position in the Harvard case. And then once the administration's changed, now the Biden administration has taken a position in favor of upholding affirmative action. So within the same case, they have switched positions, which is not often the case, but this is the type of case where that happens. And the U.S. has sent a strong message by um, putting a lot of agencies on its brief, including the Department of Defense. I think, it could, Ani, could you go back one slide? So not all of the cases at the Supreme Court are about I know, second, Lena, because we have a timer issue. Okay, I see. Now we go. Great. I was going to say not all of the cases in front of the Supreme Court are constitutional law, although it might seem that way from our recent discussion. In fact, the court actually has a really healthy IP docket. So the Supreme Court really recently granted cert in Amgen versus Sanofi. That's a patent case that I'm sure many of you are following. And it also recently granted cert in a case called Jack Daniels versus VIP Products which is a case about whether a humorous or parody use of another company's trademark is subject to the same likelihood of confusion test that applies in ordinary trademark infringement cases. Uh, but today we're actually going to talk about the third IP copyright and a case called Andy Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith. This is a case in which the Supreme Court will once again grapple with what counts as fair use of a copyrighted work, which is a defense to copyright infringement. And specifically the question that is presented for the Supreme Court is how to decide whether a secondary work is transformative of the original work. This is one of several factors that a court decides in considering whether the secondary work is making a fair use of the original work, but it's really maybe the most important factor. Uh, so it's important to get right. The background here is that back in 1984, Vanity Fair licensed a black and white photograph of the musician Prince, which you can see here on this slide, that was taken by the photographer Lynn Goldsmith, who was a renowned photographer, and licensed it to use it as an artist's reference. The artist in question was Andy Warhol, who Vanity Fair commissioned to do an illustration uh, to accompany an article on prints. Now using Ms. Goldsmith's photograph, Andy Warhol produced 12 screen prints of prints. And as you can see here, there was a purple and an orange one. Vanity Fair used the purple prints to accompany an article about prints in its magazine. And importantly, it credited Goldsmith as the photographer and it paid her a licensing fee. But then fast forward to 2016, after Prince's death, Condé Nast, uh, Vanity Fair's parent company, decides to publish a commemorative piece on his career and uses Andy Warhol's orange prints on the cover, but this time does not credit Miss Goldsmith and does not pay her a licensing fee. So a copyright infringement dispute arose between Ms. Goldsmith and between the Andy Warhol Foundation, which now has his rights uh, to his copyrighted works. And so who, who won in the Second Circuit? That's where the 
case got originally decided. Right. The Second Circuit rejected the Andy Warhol Foundation's fair use defense, basically because this work is not transformative of the original photograph. What the Second Circuit said is Andy Warhol simply imposed his style on the existing photograph and that that's not enough to constitute a transformative use. So, the the, the, but Andy Warhol Foundation is taking the position between in the front of the Supreme Court that anytime a secondary work changes the meaning or adds a new meaning to the original work, it has transformed it. And this has potentially big consequences for copyright law, uh, because as a number of the justices at oral argument said, this position taken by the Andy Warhol Foundation seems to leave very little protection for so-called derivative works. So under the Copyright Act, the owner of an original work of authorship has copyrights in works that are derived from the original work. And the statute expressly includes things that uh, recast or transform the original work. But under the Andy Warhol Foundation's interpretation of what it means to make a fair use, uh, there would essentially be a copyright defense to many, many derivative works uh, because many derivative works add some type of new meaning to the original work. But on the Andy Warhol Foundation side, they argue that the the that the two uh, works have different meanings that you know experts opine that they did that the that in in one Goldsmith's photograph shows Prince's vulnerability while Warhol sought to portray Prince as an icon. Um, there were also questions at the oral argument, sort of to the effect of you know like what to what extent do we consider the fact that you know this is Andy Warhol? Right. There seemed to be a sort of like is there a is there a specific rule for famous artists under the Copyright Act? Because there was some sense of, well, how can it not be transformative? Andy Warhol did it. Um, but of course, the justices are also grappling with creating a rule that is going to apply sensibly, regardless of the artist's fame in the particular case. Um, I found it interesting that the movie industry was brought up repeatedly at oral argument. Um, in particular, Justice Kagan asked, uh, aren't movie producers going to be surprised to learn that they don't need to pay royalties to the authors of the books and the plays that they use to create their movies? Um, and I think that was a difficult question for the Andy Warhol Foundation, because on the one hand, they don't take the position that any movie created uh, is necessarily creating a new meaning or message. But on the other hand, it's sort of hard to see how that's the case because movie producers often add things like new characters, new plot points, new themes that weren't necessarily present in the original book. Uh, but it's kind of hard to imagine a situation where they don't owe anything to that author. Uh, despite using quite a bit of, of that original work. So the movie industry was on one side for Amiki and the muse there were museums on the other side saying there's a long history of artists copying prior works of others and that museums routinely exhibit those works. So, and the Solicitor General's office weighed in as well. And they of course represent some of the biggest museums in the world. So before we go to the last topic, we're going to read the CLE code. So write down if you're listening and maybe uh, maybe someone can put this in the chat. The CLE code is 90389-90389. And last but not least, we, we can't do a Supreme Court CLE this term without talking about the newest justice, Justice Jackson. Um, justice White once famously remarked that each new justice makes it a new court. And at least from oral arguments, which is all that window we really have at this point, that that adage seems to be really true here. Um, I clerked for Justice Breyer in his first term on the Supreme Court, and uh, Justice Jackson also clerked for Justice Breyer in a, a couple terms after me. And notable from our first term was that the Justice Breyer was sort of hanging back. It was back in the free for all days, only free for all questioning, and he was kind of hanging back and you know deferring to the other justices to ask their questions. 
and, and then jumping in sort of near the end of an advocate's time and until word kind of trickled back to our chambers that the advocates were uh, being challenged by his like two minute long questions when the red light was on, they were desperately trying to reserve their rebuttal time. So he started asking earlier questions. Justice Jackson's had a much different experience here because as Lena explained at the beginning, the oral arguments are, are, are very different now than in Justice Breyer's first term. So she doesn't have to defer to anyone, uh, nor is she taking up anyone else's time when she asks her question, because even if a justice doesn't get to ask the questions they want during the free for all, there's the round robin where the chief justice is gonna go around and ask everybody a question. Justice Jackson with, with no time limit pressure has really been using her time to state how she sees a case and imposing like you know, explaining what how she views it and then asking a question. Justice Breyer used to do something kind of similar to that where he would sort of say, here's how I see the other side's five best points and what's your answer to that? Uh, hers is a little bit more focused than Justice Breyer's, but it's, you know, maybe it, maybe it brings it, has its uh, genesis there. I don't know, what are your thoughts on kind of Justice Jackson and her questioning style? Yeah, I have found it to be uh, a really entertaining questioning style. I mean, like we talked about her uh, hypothetical that got a lot of news coverage and it got a lot of attention even in the court. As the one about she, the, the Santa Claus. About and the, the Santa and... Claus in the case about public accommodations laws and religious objections to them um, because it was sort of such a startling and insightful hypothetical that it immediately sort of cried out for a response to the extent that we then saw in real time Justice Alito asking questions uh, attempting to distinguish it. And that's sort of a sign of a really good hypothetical if the other justices start taking it on themselves. Um, and I've just found her questioning style to be really, really illuminating. I mean, one, one issue is, one question is kind of like, is she purposely doing this in order, is she doing it just to like probe people's positions and figure out what she thinks, which it's definitely doing that. So it's definitely serving that purpose. But is, is she, con it, what we don't know is like, is she consciously doing this to serve some other purpose? Either, either um, one reason may be that the junior justice, um, you know, it's a chance for the junior justice to get her views in front of her colleagues because when they talk in conference, I think she gets doesn't get to vote until last. And so then a lot has already happened before she gets to express her views. And that way she would get to, you, you clerked for Justice Kagan. She was the junior justice when you clerked for Justice Kagan, wasn't she? Actually, I think Justice Gorsuch was the that junior justice at that point okay. in time. <laughs> but there are special additional um, obligations of junior justices that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. They have additional responsibilities. I mean, I, Deanne was talking about when they're in conference and the junior justice speaking last. Another thing is that because the justices are completely alone in conference, the junior justice is responsible for taking notes, uh, tallying votes, making sure that orders go out after conference representing what the court has granted cert in and a number of other things fall to the junior justice on top of all of their ordinary work as a justice. So I'm seeing questions in the chat about our questions. So despite the fact that we have two more minutes left, maybe we should, have you seen questions? Yeah, jump, we can jump to some of the questions. Um, so I saw that there was a question from somebody about how much attention the Supreme Court now gives to the perspective of history versus how much attention it gives to facts in the record for a particular case and which elements seem to matter more to the Supreme Court. So I, I have a thought on this, which is that as an appellate court, the Supreme Court will often do, is often not in the position to do factual digging. You know, it's often presented with a purely legal question. And in fact, the fact that a case does present a purely legal question in which facts are undisputed tends to make it a better candidate for a grant by the Supreme Court. So more often than not, they're sort of accepting facts as presented to them, uh, which of course are important for determining the case. But then I think 
they're more focused on enunciating the legal standard that they think is correct. And in constitutional cases, that is increasingly uh, involving them looking to a historical record, especially when they've identified that as relevant to how you're going to interpret the Constitution. But I think, you know, ex ante now, one of the things as people develop cases to go up to the court that they, th that they hope or think will go up to the court, they're going to be conscious about trying to develop those historical records and facts in the lower courts. And I've heard panels of lower court judges saying exactly how are we supposed to figure out history, you know, as lawyers, as judges, we aren't historians, how are we supposed to be sorting through these, 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 these facts. Right. It is sort of different to be the Supreme Court than to be the trial court or the intermediate appellate court on these issues that are now requiring historical analysis, because the Supreme Court gets uh, dozens of amicus briefs. It has tons of resources are invested into the cases before it. Um, and the trial courts and the intermediate appellate courts don't necessarily have that same attention being paid to each of those cases. So are there any other questions in the chat that we should try to address? I know we're running a little bit over. You want to make sure you get your full hour of CLE. If anyone wants to repost it so that it, it pops at the bottom. Otherwise. This is Jen. I just want to make sure I'm sorry, I'm doing a few things at once. Um, I want to make sure the question from Cassandra was answered. What are your predictions for the CDA 230 cases? Ah, we make a point of not making predictions. <laughs> it, it's very, and that it's very hard to predict, honestly. <laughs> I know it's one I'm going to be listening to because it's a big, big deal, but Predictions are dangerous things. And then um, Rose, um, Rosaline asked, and you may have answered this already, um, is any important, are, are there any important upcoming cases with IP? <laughs> so yeah. we have flagged two of them. Yeah, yeah. So there's Amgen versus Sanofi, which is a patent case that I think probably a lot of you are paying attention to, and I would certainly recommend it. Um, and the Jack Daniels case, also an important IP case coming up about trademark infringement. And uh, that case, if, if you're not familiar with it, involves a company that had a squeaker toy for dogs that was made to look like the Jack Daniels whiskey bottle. Um, I saw it, it looks very cute, but they apparently did not have permission from Jack Daniels to make it. <laughs> <laughs> there are also and there are also several cases that you should keep an eye on that the court has asked the Solicitor General for her views on. And when the court does that, that's a sign that they're seriously considering granting. Um, one involves um, if you're familiar, if you're a pharma IP litigator, uh, the skinny label issue. So um, and if you're and then it, uh, a couple of cases on Section 101. So uh, if you've been following Section 101, you know that this is not the first time the Supreme Court has asked the Solicitor General for his or her views, and uh, they don't always uh, take the ones that they say. And so uh, it's hard to know exactly why they keep asking, <laughs> but, they, but they have. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Janet, are there any other questions you see in the chat? I didn't see any others. I think that's every, and if anyone has any others, please feel free to unmute yourself right now and ask. I, I'm going through, and those were all the ones that I had um, I, I had uh, a view into. Okay. Well, in the meantime, I just want to thank Deanne and Lena so much for leading. What a fantastic discussion. So interesting, especially on some of these really hot topics. And thank you so much to Morrison Foster for sponsoring our very first monthly accelerator. Thank you so much for your support. Our next accelerator is on Tuesday, February 7. So I invite everybody to please visit the events page on the CHIPS website to get more information and you can register. Uh, and if your organization is interested in hosting an accelerator, give me a shout. I'd be happy to chat with you about how we can make that happen. So thank you again. And thank you so much to our partners, Morrison and Foster. It's been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us.